Hello, and welcome to the Siddle Research and Practice Brief Series. The purpose of this series is to have conversations around the innovation of use of technology in special education, early childhood, related services, and leadership personnel preparation programs. Today, we have Dr. Michelle Tobe as our guest expert to share with us her research and practice on how pre-service teachers can use data in their classroom. Welcome, Dr. Tobe. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Uh, I'm Kenneth Holman as well introduce myself. Uh, so my first question, Dr. Tobe, is can you tell us a little bit about your research and practice and how it can be applied to your te to teacher preparation programs? Sure. Um, so first, just to tell you a little bit about myself, I'm an assistant, an assistant professor of learning sciences and educational research at the University of Central Florida. Um, my research focuses on studying self-regulated learning and how technology supports the use of self-regulatory processes and learning across different contexts. So this can be in the classroom, uh, using a game-based learning environment, or during a training session of some kind. Um, and using technology can certainly look different across these different contexts than across schools, classes, or students. Uh, but the goal is collecting different types of data to capture these individual differences so we can provide support that is adaptive to each individual learners, um, to each individual learner, excuse me. Um, I think it can be applied to teacher preparation because as great as it would be to just present teachers and student data, we should also be including teachers a little bit more and have them act as learning scientists in their classrooms. Uh, so to be learning scientists, we need to prepare teachers by teaching them about and exposing them to the different types of data that can be collected. Uh, so to give you just one example, uh, one type of data that I think could be really useful in the classroom is collecting students' spatial expressions of emotions and that would be to determine the emotions they're expressing during class. So are students confused during one particular lesson? And what do I need to do as a teacher about my instructional practices that can address uh, that student confusion? So what do we need to expose teachers to so they can easily and quickly evaluate the types of information uh, to help with their instructional practices? That's pretty neat. Uh, what opportunities do you think your research may have for improving higher personnel and related service programs that prepare professionals who serve students with disabilities? Um, I think it can be useful to be able to collect these data and providing support uh, for using these data for students with disabilities, because this can help address the specific exceptionality that the student is possessing or the student, uh, the student has. So not only are we improving programs to help students with disabilities by providing new tools they can use, we're also providing training on how they can use the these tools so we can provide individualized support to each student and their exceptionalities. So, for example, what does it mean if this student, if one student is demonstrating a lack of visual attention based on their gaze patterns, which we can collect from their eye tracking data? And then in comparison, another student might have persistent, uh, persisting levels of frustration, and we can detect that from their facial expressions or from their levels of stress. So it seems like one student is struggling with their cognitive or attentional processes, and another um, needs help regulating their emotions. So to, eat, to help each student, a teacher or other personnel would need to know how to detect all of this and what type types of inferences they need to make. So as a learning scientist, this is what I do in my lab when I collect student learning data. So what I think we should do is how can I share my skills and help these teachers so that they can then help students with exceptionalities and you know collect these data? Sounds like a great opportunity. Um, next question is what challenges, if any, do you think might have emerged when applying or implementing your research in professional preparation? I think one of the biggest challenges I have encountered is to make sure teachers and schools don't think that my goal is to replace them. So yes, there's a lot of talk about implementing artificial intelligence into learning technologies, uh, but these, these are different systems like game-based learning environments, intelligent tutoring systems. They're for students to use um, as supplements to the curriculum in the classroom. So we're not trying to replace the teachers by 
having students use these tools instead of having teachers. Um, we're trying to help teachers by providing additional tools that they can use to help with their instructional decision making and their instructional practices. Um, I wish I could start off any conversation by saying that we're not trying to replace teachers. <laughs> Yeah, that's definitely something they worry about, but I, I want them to understand as well that that is not the case at all. Right. What would you recommend for a teacher preparation program that is just starting with this specific topic? Well, first I'd recommend um, no one um, should be in a rush to get any kind of program developed. Uh, what I mean by this is take your time to sort out all the details before just implementing this type of program into the classroom. Um, I think this kind of program can be useful and effective, but not if people implementing it didn't do their homework first. Um, so now you might ask me, well, what kind of homework are you talking about? So I think that would involve reading and becoming familiar with the research on using these types of data. Um, having the opportunities to ask questions and engage in discussion about that, and then taking some time to also play around with the technology. Uh, so just uh, I'll, I'll elaborate a little bit further. Um, so I think it's really important to become familiar with what's already out there. So take some time to read some journal publications or conference papers. Uh, speaking of which, try to go to conferences if that's possible. Um, it would be useful um, for my first tip, um, so just becoming familiar with the literature, but also the second one about not being afraid to ask questions. So when papers are published, the authors, they share their emails. So that means uh, emails are available to any reader. Take advantage of that and send them an email. Uh, worst case is they don't respond, which might not be the nicest, um, but I think we can get over that. Um, if someone is attending a conference, uh, the researchers that you might read their paper on, they might be there. So that would be um, a, just a great opportunity to be able to ask them questions. Um, I think that would be even better than an email. Um, they also might share some ideas they have with you that you can then implement into the classroom. So take advantage of that. And I mean, going to conferences is not um, necessarily um, easy, but if you can, Try to do that. Um, and third, um, so make sure you have uh, the chance to become familiar with whatever you're using. So if you're using these different types of uh, data channels, make sure you know um, what you're dealing with, what you're using. So you don't need to become an expert on anything, but you want to become more of an expert than you might have been before. Um, also, so now you know me. So um, if you want, you can reach out to me and I can help too. <laughs> Those are some great recommendations. Thank you. Um, what else should teacher preparation programs consider moving forward? So if anyone is interested in taking this approach of bringing learning sciences to the classroom, I would suggest that just because all of these data and technologies are available, it doesn't mean they all need to be used, um, especially at the same time. So instead, I would say really think about what you're trying to accomplish with this program uh, that you're implementing and how these tools can help you accomplish that or, um, or your goals. Um, so if you don't think about student emotions, don't collect that data. Um, I'm biased and think it would be helpful, but maybe um, if you don't think it's helpful, don't collect that. So hopefully you get uh, what I'm saying here. Just don't collect it just because you can. Collect it because it's important. Um, and one other thing, uh, which I guess which probably would have been helpful for when I mentioned for do, things to do for your homework, um, make sure you understand the kind of data you're getting and what they mean. So back to my example with emotions, using facial detection software is great, but remember that it's not necessarily going to be 100% 100, 100 accurate. Um, so these technologies are using algorithms that are detecting the likelihood of a presence of an emotion, which basically means someone seems to be demonstrating an emotion, but we know algorithms aren't perfect. So just because someone smiles, it doesn't mean they're happy. 
right? Um, my favorite example is to use the frustrated smile um, because sometimes someone is smiling because they're so frustrated. Um, so, and that's probably different from a feeling um, of enjoyment. So it's just making sure you know um, what you're getting when you're getting uh, your data output. And my point here is also related to the challenge that I mentioned before, it's that computers aren't perfect and we still do need humans in the loop to interpret information. So instead of a teacher concluding one student is angry based on the data, I'd still recommend that the teacher would then talk to that student to find out what's going on. Um, so it's really important to do that. Um, so basically, I'm trying to get the message that we have all these new technologies and they can be really useful for detecting and fostering student learning. And as teachers, we need to use or not need, we can use sorry, these technologies <laughs> to help with our instructional practices and decision making. Um, and again, it's not to replace teachers, it's to help them. Well, very nice. Thank you, Dr. Tobe. Um, so I just want to thank you again for sharing your taking your time with us today and sharing your research and practice on learning sciences and data in the classroom. We appreciate your time and work. Hope uh, we have more opportunities to continue our conversation about your work and for more information about CIDL research and practice briefs and other resources for teacher education and related service per personnel preparation, please go to CIDDL.org, CIDL.org. Uh, don't forget to follow us on social media, subscribe to our channel, and leave us a message. Thank you all for joining us. Again, Dr. Tobe, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Kevin. Bye-bye.